Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 36th meeting of 2018. Before we move on to the first item on the agenda, I remind everyone to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take the items five and six in private and to agree that its review of evidence heard both in relation to the EU exit and the environment and relation to notifications arising from the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 should be considered, considered in private at future meetings. Are we agreed? Thank you. Okay, the second item on the agenda for the committee to take evidence on the waste, miscellaneous amendments, EU exit regulations 2019. And this morning I'm delighted to welcome Elspeth MacDonald, Environmental Quality and Circular Economy Division for the Scottish Government, and Emily Freeman, Director of Legal Services for the Scottish Government. Welcome to you both. Um, the first question, I suppose, relates to where the, the decision-making powers is going to go uh, in the event of, of a no-deal Brexit around the, the waste regulations. Um, it's, we are reading that um, targets for Scotland should be set by the Secretary of State, our Secretary of State of the UK Government, rather than Scottish ministers. Could you provide any further information on why it considers um, this to be acceptable? In what, I'm sorry, in what particular context? Well, because there are, yeah, there are targets well, right throughout the area. Yeah, so, so the, what, specifically I'm talking about the Waste and Emissions Trading Act. Um, yes, certainly. Um, what the notification says, and, and um, I have to explain that this has been as carefully crafted as we can to give full information to the Parliament, so we understand there may be a need of further information, but we hope we've covered it properly, is that the regulations operate to retain the power to set UK targets in future years. Um, the power as amended by the regulations, however, is not mandatory. The existing power is mandatory in future. If there's a, a no-deal Brexit, it will not be mandatory. Um, and can only be exercised with the agreement of all the devolved administrations. So the effect of that is that we, as Scottish Government, can participate in a future UK allowance scheme if we so choose, but we do not have to do so. The other point that arises from what you're asking is that the... the retention of the power or the, uh, the option to use, to use this power um, does not affect the power of Scottish ministers themselves to set their own targets for the future. And ministers have already set a zero requirement for biodegradable, biodegradable, I beg your pardon, municipal waste, which will apply from January 2021. Now this was in fact set by the Waste Scotland Regulations 2012, um, quite a long time ago, because in, in Scotland, on waste disposal, we're, we're quite far ahead on targets. So, um, and that was obviously, came before this Parliament, and any future Scottish uh, regulations in this area would come before this Parliament. Regardless, regardless of this, the, when it comes to target setting, this committee will still be able to scrutinise the target set for Scotland, whether there was a, the same is the UK or they differ in any way? If the, the regulations are UK with Scottish consent, um, that would be something that would come to the Parliament under Section 57 of the Scotland Act. So you would get the normal notification in that event and you could have, of course, asked for evidence as a result of that. And do we see that situation changing? I mean, is this, it's just a, a, a temporary situation yeah, for a no-deal scenario, it which, is which may change in the future. Yes, it's a temporary situation. Well, it's this whole set of regulations is to deal with a no-deal scenario, and it is entirely about keeping current systems operating where that is still appropriate and making changes so that um, so that there is no cessation of operability, is the way we tend to um, express it within government. We need everything to continue to run as it is now. And that's what all of this is about. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. 
Um, just a wee technical point, picking up on uh, what I've just heard about uh, requiring all four administrations to provide consent. Um, who at the moment would give consent on behalf of Northern Ireland is the first half. And the second half is, in the absence of a consent, but also the absence of non-consent, is it taken as consent? It requires proactive consent. Sorry, to answer your first question, I, I, I must confess I don't know. The Northern Ireland um, Environment Department is making um, contributions to this process, and I'm afraid that's as far as my um, knowledge at this point in time goes. And I would imagine that it would depend on how the devolution settlement in Northern Ireland continues. Um, but um, if there is, if one administration fails to consent and it requires active consent, then the regulation, no regulations would be made. Uh, well, you can see, convener, why I asked the question then, that we might want consent to be given by everyone, but if Northern Ireland is unable to give consent under the way the regulations are framed, that could be an issue for us. Now, given that we can't answer that today, I suggest that we perhaps pursue that by other means. Yes, no, I agree. And just on that subject then, would the regulations just not continue? I mean, what would the, would the status quo continue or currently, life, life would is, go on? Currently, there are targets set under the landfill Scotland regulations um, 2012, I think. Um, no, the landfill regulations 2012. There is, a, there is an ongoing set of targets that all the administrations are working towards. Um, and that will carry on until March 2020 because that's how long the scheme is set for already. Um, and after that date, um, all administrations will need to consider how they're proceeding. But there is no guarantee that there will be a future UK scheme. Equally, there's no guarantee that there will not be agreement for a future UK scheme. Cross that bridge when we come yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. Stuart Stevenson. Um, right, let me uh, move on to Commission Decision 2005-32-EC, which relates to hazardous waste. Um, and uh, it, it, it's now uh, the case that we're told um, that uh, Scottish ministers will have the power uh, to decide on the classifications of hazardous waste. And I suppose it's quite a simple question, um, just what discussions have been had with SEPA that's on the assumption that uh, the advice on classification would come from SEPA. Now, of course, you, you might tell us that it would come from elsewhere. No, um, you're, you're quite correct. We would expect advice on hazardous waste to come from SEPA. Um, we regularly engage with SEPA on the full range of waste-related deficiency issues, um, simply because they are in the front line on all of this. Um, so that includes on hazardous waste. SEPA works with the other environmental agencies within the UK um, in the list of waste decision process. And there is joint UK guidance on waste classification and assessment known as WM3. Um, going forward, um, the Scottish Government would work with SEPA um, in deciding when and when not further waste. Could well, be. let me just pick up. You said going forward, the Scottish Government would. Have they already engaged with SEPA? Because oh, yes, sorry. I meant, yes, they do. Just to be clear. They, they do engage with SEPA, and on, in the future, they would. On this well. specific subject? Yes. That's, yes. that's and, and so, therefore, it, it would be reasonable to assume that SEPA has the necessary skills and personnel in place to deal with this. Oh, yes, yes. That's fine. Thank yes. you. I'm, and, in fact, because I was coming before this committee, I... I um, spoke to my contact and see <laughs> just to be double clear I can come and say these things to you but yes um, they have a long history of being involved in that's all right. of this thank you John Scott thank you convener and just in terms of the control of pollution amendment act 1989 to give you a reference point section 2 of the notification states that carriers from EU member states will no longer be exempt from registration Presumably this means that because the EU system will no longer apply in the UK, then EU, then 
EU carriers will have to register to adhere to the UK system. Now, while this may not be a policy decision itself, apparently, um, and therefore not necessarily a deliberate policy change, but it has the effect of being a policy change, can the Scottish Government confirm that EU carriers will have to register to adhere to the UK system? Um, yes. Um, if I can roll back from that a little bit and, by way of preface, say that this has been an iterative process with DEFRA over time. And at the time I prepared and lodged this um, notice, I said, we'll no longer, having dug further over time, because we're doing our own Scottish regs, we discovered that the power to make that exemption had, in fact, never been used. That, in fact, EU carriers currently have to register with SEPA. Right. Uh, and I apologise, this was not meant to mislead the committee. It was, it was, it was the, the fact that that was the change that was being made. They will no longer be able to. But in fact, they have not exercised that power. So EU, registered, uh, EU carriers have to register with SEPA or the other environment, environment agencies in, in the UK. And that will continue which means that this will continue as business as usual. It's not only not a policy change, it's not an operational change. Um, OK, that's great. Thank you. And could um, this have any border implications, especially um, if there's a no-deal scenario, but from what you're saying, possibly not? Well, that's for the operation of UK carriers. Carriers within the UK, mm -hmm. currently, carriers would be able to operate out with the UK as well, and that is a position um, which is subject to ongoing work with colleagues in the UK government and the other devolved administrations and environment agencies in relation to a reserved set of regulations covering <coughs> transfrontier shipment of waste, which even the, the European Commission has identified as an issue that needs to be resolved and has come out with a, a very helpful notification recently. Thank you very much. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I, I seem to hear that if a carrier registered with the Environment Agency south of the border, that that would provide registration for the whole of the UK. Is that similarly the case if they were to register with any of the environment uh, bodies in the four jurisdictions, that that would cover the whole of the UK? The, there is a mutual recognition of the... Um, registrations across the UK because they work to the same standards. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Ruskell. Thanks. Um, a number of the EU instruments haven't been transposed yet and, you know, we're clearly running out of time. So do, do you anticipate any of those instruments not being transposed the, the in time for, for withdrawal? Or, and and if, if that's the case, what will the Scottish Government do? Right. I'll take this in bits if I may. Yeah. The, the EU regulations and decisions in this notification are already directly applicable. The EU Withdrawal Act operates so that these regulations and decisions become part of domestic law. And what these regulations do is amend them so that they work properly within our domestic law in the UK, including in Scotland. It, that means there is no need to do any further work to make sure these work in relation to our <coughs> domestic law. Um, as regards directives, we are working through to make sure that anything that is not transposed is dealt with in our own Scottish deficiencies instruments, and that work is reasonably well advanced. And we, we well, expect to finish that, we expect to complete that well, well, before well, exit date. Right, you expect to. Yes. Um, can you guarantee that, that that will be in place? And if it isn't in place, what, what will be the work beyond exit day? If there is a no-deal scenario, um, what we're identifying just now are the deficiencies that, that need to be in place before exit day to ensure operability after exit day. And why I say the, the, the words expect to, um, it's because nobody can guarantee everything totally in real life. But the, the, the very real ambition and hope we expect to complete all that work ready for exit day if it happens. Any further changes that might be desirable 
flowing from direct, di um, directives or e EU law would be possible under the, if we have a, an agreement, if we have a withdrawal agreement, would be um, available for change under the Withdrawal Act. But that's, that's not a scenario that we're actually working towards at this point in time. We need to make all the changes we need to before exit day. Um, can I just ask about a, a, another issue, uh, and, it, and it's in relation to incineration. Do you feel that there are gaps in the regulations and, and guidance in relation to the incineration of waste at the moment? It's an area which isn't explicitly covered no, by um, the SSI. I'm, Apologise, I'm not able to answer that question. Um, it's it's not something that I've dealt with in the in the the notification process per se. Uh, is there? Well, you... uh, focus this a bit more. Then, I mean, if if this SI is approved, will there be scope within it for the Scottish government to set targets, say a cap on incineration? Because implicit in this SI is targets for recycling and ban on landfill waste and everything else. Would this SI allow a cap on incineration? This SI wouldn't change any law that ex already exists. So I'm sorry, I just don't have the specific knowledge of the area to which you're referring. Can, you, can you write back to the committee, if that's OK? Yes. Um, with yeah. a letter. Yeah, so that's, that's something we can get more detail. I mean, I would love to reason. say to you, I think that that's correct, because I do think it's correct, but I don't know. I need to check that for Okay, that would be fine, yeah. yeah that's brilliant. Thanks. Happy for you to get back in touch with thank us you. and let us know. John Scott. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, can I take you to the framework discussions and um, notification says that there will be administrative changes it also states that we've been engaged in framework discussions with all the administrations of the UK and the relevant regulators, specifically looking at the waste regulations in the UK outside of the EU and its existing regime. Could the Scottish Government provide, therefore, more detail on who is involved in the framework discussions and, given how wide-ranging the field of waste legislation is, what precisely the discussions are about and what role is SEPA playing in this? The focus to date has been on addressing deficiencies um, in legislation. Um, and in doing that, we have identified that there may be value in a common framework to support areas where coordination and cooperation would potentially be of benefit. The example that comes to mind is on producer responsibility uh, provisions for end-of-life vehicles, etc., which are currently dealt with on the UK basis, but there are other areas. Discussions, these discussions are at a very early stage. Um, we are slightly driven by um, the fact that DEFRA is concentrating on the SIs and this is a, a subsequent, logically it's a subsequent development. Um, and um, so we're at a very early stage and we are just going to continue with that work um, as soon as we can basically. As regards SEPA's involvement in it, it has such a wide-ranging um, remit across the waste management area. Of course, we would involve SEPA in, in these considerations. There's, there's no doubt about that. And, and what specifically, what would their role be, or would just it, 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 to it, be it, defined? It would be their normal advisory and information-giving role, and. I think that would be, they, are, they also have powers to anticipate uh, or at least to provide advice on technical change, technological changes, etc. So we would look to them to provide a full range of supporting um, information and advice on these um, frameworks. Apart from anything else, quite often they are effectively within the UK um, operating in a frame framework, even though it's not being formalised. And, and given, uh, are they adequately resourced to do all of this again, one has to ask, given the declining budgets and things? Well, yes, as I think so. I mean, as far as I'm aware, they are adequately resourced, but mm -hmm. that's a, that is actually a question for SEPA. Mm -hmm. It's not for me to yes. advise on that. Fair enough. Thanks very much. Finley Carson. 
Morning, uh, revocations. The notification says that a number of EU regulations and decisions are to be revoked, but doesn't actually identify them. Could you identify these the regulations and decisions that are to be revoked? Certainly. Um, and um, I, I, would, I would ask if the committee wishes this kind of information to be included in the next notification. I'm more than happy to do so. It's just it's a list of 20 decisions and regulations, and it's, it's dry as dust, to be honest. Um, but um, um, what I can do is read them through to you, or I would be more than happy to send the list to the clerk. Probably be a better, a better <laughs> idea in terms of efficiency. <laughs> so we'll, 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 yeah, um, we're ha if you're happy, Finlay, we have that as an happy. answer. Yes, yes um, it, 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 it is basically, in, 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 in short form, it's revocation of instruments that are either spent, that we have in fact transposed into domestic legislation, or are um, reporting rather requirements that involve doing things to or for the Commission. I, that's probably come out wrong, <laughs> wrongly, but um, it, it's that genre of, of um, instruments. So I will send these on to the clerk when we get back to the office. Okay. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, this is just a, a general point on the layout of the notification. Um, after each of the headings, EU regulations and EU decisions, there's a, a general paragraph which states that a number of EU regulations or decisions will be amended. It then goes on to detail several specific regulations or, or decisions. So can you confirm that every regulation and decision which this SI concerns, uh, other than the revocations, is specified in the notification? Yes, the, the, the general paragraph was an attempt to explain the, the, the general process and the um, aims to be achieved by the, the regulations, and we have gone into each and every regulation that is dealt with. Okay, thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm quite honestly somewhat out of my depth with this, but I'll, I'll try it anyway. Um, the notification mentions that uh, another notification um, in this subject area is anticipated in December uh, 2018, where we now are. Um, why could you perhaps clarify for us, has the Scottish Government separated consideration of the notifications, and is it appropriate to consider notifications in isolation? Um, those two. Those two. Yeah. Um, the, this notification is in respect of regulations that are subject to affirmative procedure in Westminster, and therefore we have to satisfy their parliamentary requirements and also the protocol we have had to take this notification forward much earlier than the second, the notification for the second set of regulations, which is, is um, in a negative procedure. And it is a parliamentary procedure point coupled with protocol requirements. And I suppose driven by um, times timetables in DEFRA as well, but it, it's a, a technical reason. It's, there is no intention to split them up for for any other reason. That's very helpful, thank you. Yeah. I just have a final question. You know, this is all in preparation for a no deal. This is a tremendous amount of work that's been, been done. Presumably, in the event of a deal, it's a case of going back and looking at all of these all over again. Is that what the case is? It would depend on the deal. Well, first of all, if there was no deal, we would presumably have to go back and consider what if anything of this work is relevant to what we need to do going forward. So um, it, there, there, it may be quite helpful and it may not be, we don't know. But as far as, um, as the work is concerned, if there is no deal, it, it, it's, it's on a range from it might be useful to it's completely nugatory. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions. Thank you very much for coming in today to, to help us with our deliberations. Thank you. We'll suspend for a couple of minutes just to
The third the item on our agenda today is to consider a number of requests from the Scottish Government to the Committee to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to a number of UK statutory instruments. The first of these is the Persistent Organic Pollutants Regulations of 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 5th of December. Do we have any comments on those? No, we don't. Are we content to give our consent for UK ministers to lay these regulations in the UK Parliament? Yes. yes. The second instrument is the Control of Mercury Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 5th of December. Do we have any comments on this? No, we don't. Are we content for the Scottish Government to give its consent to UK ministers to lay these regulations? Thank you. Thank you. The third instrument is the Equine Records Identification and Movement Amendment of Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 5th of December. Do we have any comments on this statutory instrument? No. Content. No, we don't. Are we content? Yes. Thank you. The fourth instrument is the Animal Welfare Amendment Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for, the con for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 5th of December. Do we have any comments? John, I believe you do. Um, yes, um, I do. I just would like clarification um, from whomsoever is appropriate um, that uh, the UK has decided to continue to recognise transporter authorisations from the EU countries to the UK, but it's not clear if this is a reciprocal agreement with the EU. So, if we could have clarification on that, please. We can certainly make that point as for clarification when we send a letter of consent. That's, a, oh, that's in the transport section of the Animal Welfare Amendment. Yep. Okay. Um, Mark? Um, just a, a further clarification, convener, and it's just in relation to the decision-making powers over uh, uh, whether the practice of live animal export should be banned or not, and whether this regulation has any bearing on that in terms of the mix of uh, devolved and reserved responsibilities. Um, so it's really a point of clarification perhaps for the Scottish Government about where they now see their powers, powers lying uh, in relation to uh, these regulations. So two points of clarification, but beyond that, are we content to give our consent to this statutory instrument? Yes, yes, we are. Okay. The fifth instrument is the fluorinated greenhouse gases and ozone depleting substances regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 6th of December. Have we got any comments on this? Yes. Another brief comment, convener. Um, I noted that um, it, effectively this regulation could allow the Scottish Government to go faster in terms of the phase out of ozone depleting substances. Um, I think it'd be useful to get clarity from the Scottish Government about whether they would continue to see reductions in uh, ozone depleting substances in line with other parts of the UK or whether they see any benefit in accelerating the phase out in Scotland. If, do you think that, that that affects this statutory instrument or is that just more a general question about the Scottish Government's um, ambitions it, in this regard? I, I think it, it's, I would find it useful context in relation to this regulation and how it will be used in a withdrawal scenario. Okay. Well, we can reflect that in our letter. All that being said, do we consent? Content, yep. Yep. Thank you. The sixth instrument is the Nagoya Protocol Compliance Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 10th of December. Do we have any comments on this? No, we don't. Are we content for the Scottish Government to give its consent for UK ministers to lay these regulations in the UK Parliament? We are. Mm -hmm. The seventh instrument is the Air Quality Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent in the Scottish Parliament is the 10th of December. Do we have any comments on this? We don't. Are we content for the Scottish Government to give its consent to the UK ministers to lay this regulation in the UK Parliament? We are. The eighth instrument is the Air Quality Number 2 Regulations 2018 members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 10th of December. Do we have any comments? No. no. Are we content to give our consent for the Scottish Government? Content. Thank you. 
The ninth instrument is the Marine Environment Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from Scottish Parliament is the 11th of December. Have we any comments? No. The committee content for Scottish Government to give its consent to UK ministers to lay these regulations in the UK Parliament? Yes. Okay. And the tenth instrument is the Agriculture Zootechnics Miscellaneous Amendments. Members will notice note that the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 12th of December. Members should be aware that this notification was also sent to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee as the proposed instrument relates to both remits. Each committee has been asked to consent only to the elements of the notification relevant to the remit. Members should note that no legal or policy issues were raised in relation to this proposed instrument insofar it relates to this committee. Do we have any comments? No. no? Are we content for the Scottish Government to give its consent for UK ministers to lay this instrument in the UK Parliament? Yes. We are. Our final instrument is the Farriers Registration and Animal Health Amendment Regulations 2019. Members will note the deadline for consent for the Scottish Parliament is the 12th of December. Again, members should be aware this notification was also sent to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee as the proposed instrument relates to both remits. Each committee has been asked to consent only to the elements of the notification relevant to the remit. Members should note that no legal or policy issues were raised in relation to this proposed instrument insofar it relates to this committee. Do we have any comments? No. Nope. Nope. Are we content for the Scottish Government to give its consent to UK ministers to really, uh, lay these regulations in the UK Parliament? Content. We are. Thank you. I can confirm that the committee will write to the Scottish Government in relation to all the instruments today and include the points that have been raised. Okay, we're going to suspend. We're going to suspend for a couple of minutes to allow our pa panel to change.
Okay. The fourth item, item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the EU exit and the environment from the Scottish Government. I'm delighted to welcome Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, and Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity. They're joined by their officials, Katrina Carmichael, Deputy Director of Environment and Land Use Strategy, David Barnes, National Advisor for Agriculture, and Mike Palmer, Deputy Director of Marine Scotland. I believe that both Cabinet Secretaries have an opening statement to make. If I could ask Rosanna Cunningham if she would like to give her Thank you, Convener. I'll be brief. Um, uh, both uh, Fergus Ewing and myself are very concerned about the likely negative impacts that Brexit will have um, for both our portfolios. There are three specific points that I wanted to make about uh, the expected impact across my own portfolio um, and a very brief flag up as to how we're responding. First, um, I think it's clear that the current proposed deal is pretty bad for Scotland and the UK. Um, it would uh, severely damage our economy, including our exporting sectors such as food, fishing and aquaculture. And in particular, the political declaration fails to provide strong guarantees on the protection of environmental standards, leaving these vital issues for another day. And second, despite the uncertainty, I do want to explain to the committee over the course of this session, the scale, breadth and complexity of work underway um, uh, across each of the Scottish Government directorates and public bodies which support my portfolio. This isn't just about uh, the extensive secondary legislation programme, but it's also about a much broader programme of operational readiness planning and beyond the transition period about engaging with the UK Government on UK frameworks where they are in Scotland's interests and on the implications of EU exit-related primary legislation being brought forward by the UK Government. In light of that, I'm continually reviewing my portfolio priorities, and in some cases, including the development of a new environment strategy, I've taken the decision to slow our progress until such time as the main hurdle of the no-deal preparations has been crossed. And thirdly, in a lot of important areas, we're still waiting on further clarity from the UK Government, so we don't actually yet know what the full extent of that impact will be. And that includes on how EU funding will be replaced after exit, which is an issue that goes off across both portfolios, and how environmental protections will be guaranteed in the future UK-EU relationship since the referendum vote. And I've made clear the Scottish Government's ambition to maintain equivalence with high EU standards and for that to continue to be tracked. And for that reason, um, I've decided to hold back publication of the consultation on environmental governance uh, for a very brief period so that we can set out a more meaningful set of options for cons consultees to consider once the future pic picture is more clear. Um, my, official, my officials will be continuing to develop the consultation proposals and to engage with the UK government and other devolved administrations on respective plans for future environmental principles and governance. And that is a live discussion that's ongoing. So I hope that statement does just help set out for the committee both the extent of the work and also, uh, if you like, a current sit rep in terms of environmental governance and principles. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to everyone. Um, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. Um, during the referendum, Leave campaigners, uh, including UK government ministers, promised there would be no loss of funding. So the UK government must now deliver on that promise. If they renege on their promise, the potential consequences for rural Scotland are serious. But despite this, convener, we are working responsibly on preparations for Brexit. We're doing so in a detailed and thorough manner. For example, we're working with DEFRA preparing statutory instruments to ensure we have a functioning basis upon which to operate on exit day. This will ensure continuity of farm payments and of the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, as well as fisheries management arrangements from next March. We're engaging with DEFRA on the Agriculture and Fisheries Bills. On the Ag Bill, we asked Mr Gove to make amendments that would bring the bill into line with devolution, where it is wrongly taking powers from this Parliament and also to deliver on the promises that were made during the referendum campaign, including the promise to replace all lost EU funding. The UK Government has so far rejected our amendments. As a second best, I asked Mr Gove to make a commitment on the record in Hansard in the House of Commons about future funding. To date, he has not agreed to either point. 
I still hope, convener, we can find an agreed solution on these issues, and we will keep pressing the UK Government on them. The Fisheries Bill is at an earlier stage. We had sight of it only extremely late in the day. That's meant we've had little time to work with DEFRA to improve it, although that's what we've done. Uh, and we have managed to make improvements. But I remain concerned about a number of omissions, particularly allocation of fishing opportunities, funding for our coastal communities, and the sea fish levy, on which I'll be writing to Mr Gove this week seeking amendments. Finally, I want to raise our concern at the impact on Scottish fisheries and aquaculture of the UK Government's withdrawal agreement and the political declaration. Despite the Prime Minister's claims, a link between trade and access to waters has been conceded, allowing for exclusion of fisheries and aquaculture from tariff-free access through a temporary customs union under the so-called backstop if a fisheries agreement acceptable to the UK cannot be achieved. To compound this, convener, aquaculture has now been bound into this deal alongside fisheries, setting up one vital Scottish sector against another and showing a complete disregard for these key Scottish interests. This, we feel, is a disturbing development and one which occurred without any form of meaningful engagement with the Scottish Government. So, in conclusion, I will again be writing to Mr Gove this week to outline these concerns. Thank you. I mean, can I ask, we're just listening to both your statements there, can I ask you, I mean, it strikes me that the Scottish Government is having to cope with a hugely onerous amount of work on top of the work that you're normally doing in order to prepare for an old deal. And is that, that impression, what's actually happening in government? Are you getting any extra resources from civil servants to help you cope with this workload? Or is it just a case of, of people are having to put in this tremendous amount of work in the event of a no deal to prepare so that effectively Scotland still works? Well, uh, uh, yes, to all of that. We, do, we, we, we have some extra resources, but we don't have uh, proportionately the same extra resources as, for example, uh, DEFRA itself has. So uh, that creates a bit of an issue uh, already. Um, uh, secondly, an enormous amount of the work that's going on at the moment is in preparation for a no deal, um, which has to be done because if there is no deal, these are, this is work that's on the identifiable issues that will be a real concern literally the very next day. So that work all has to be done in preparation for a no deal, notwithstanding that, in fact, if there is a deal, all of that work will have been <laughs> for, in hindsight, for nothing. But, of course, at this stage of the proceedings, you have to do it. Um, and all of that is being done by the same people who are also doing the more proactive uh, work, which might be for looking at how we would work into the longer term, uh, but also the same officials who are also having the discussions with DEFRA officials about you know, potential frameworks mm. uh, and all the rest of it. So in, in our case, it's all of the same people that are doing it right across the board. There isn't a separate, discrete team doing SIs and a completely separate, discrete team doing frameworks and... So that would be a, a misunderstanding of how it works. We have a really good, hard-working team of officials um, across both portfolios who are actually working on all of this. Um, and yes, that is having an impact. There isn't any doubt about that. Um, uh, we are managing it thus far um, with careful and astute <laughs> management, but in some cases it might mean, you know, for example, our decision to... Uh, just slow down on the consultation is more is more is not so much about uh, workload. It's more about well, at the moment we've got a set of question marks, mm. so there there needs to be you know some clarity there. Uh, and in other areas, it will be just trying to manage the workload so that you are making sure that things are done on time uh, when they're necessary to be done. But that may mean other things will have to slide you know, by a month or two. And, and officials are making these decisions all the time. Some of the decisions end up having to be decisions that both uh, uh, Fergus Ewing and I make at a ministerial level as well. Um, uh, at the moment, none of them are huge decisions. <laughs> They're still working decisions. Um, but that's kind of where we are at the moment. And, uh, you know, one of the real issues is all of this is now an enormous part of our day job. Um, and it's part of the day job that nobody could have envisaged, you know, two and a half years ago. Um, uh, so, of necessity, uh, it, is, it is creating a problem. Okay. Thank you.
John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, good morning, um, cabinet secretaries. Um, I've been want to declare an interest uh, as a farmer, and I uh, asked to ask the questions on agriculture, uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps. Um, and given that the, unlike the Welsh government and the era for Northern Ireland, the Scottish government has not accepted the UK government's offer to include a Scottish schedule in the bill. This means that the provision of the bill do not extend to Scotland. And the UK government states that the offer is still on the table for the UK agriculture bill. So is it still under consideration by the Scottish government that a Scottish schedule will be added into the UK agricultural bill? And if so, that's good. And if not, why not? Uh, it is still an option. The Secretary of State has said that. This would require the consent of the Scottish Parliament. We have expressed serious concerns with the bill. Uh, the reason is that we understand that there are at least three respects in which it predates upon the powers of this Parliament, that those are in shorthand compliance with the WTO agreement, producer organisations and fair dealings in agricultural supply chains. We have set out, convener, the reasoning behind our assertion that these powers would be taken away from this Parliament. We have asked DEFRA in response to explain their reasoning for taking the opposite view. And my understanding is that they have declined to do so, or at least they have not done so. Uh, that wouldn't be acceptable in a court of law. You can't just make assertions and not back them up. We backed up our arguments. They haven't backed up theirs. Nonetheless, uh, despite that, we are continuing to seek to resolve these and working across um, at an official level at UK government. We have workman right relations with the ministers, Mr Gove, Mr Eustace and others. Um, but as matters stand, and as members will know in the LCM, which we have tabled to the Scottish Parliament in accordance with the rules, uh, it's not acceptable that this bill would predate on the powers of, of this Parliament, particularly since agriculture has been devolved for just about uh, 20 years. I want to stress that, you know, putting it in shorthand for the farmer in the field, as it were, uh, there is absolutely no problem in our continuing to make payments. There's no practical difficulty in doing that. It's an issue which has some legal complexity, but I want to assure farmers and crofters listening to this that that is not an issue. And the presence or absence of a schedule uh, frame in, in the Agriculture Bill 2 is not something that in substance makes any difference to our capacity to deliver for farmers and crofters the sustainable future. What is important is the issue of funding. Because before elections promises were made, before referenda promises were made, and the UK government has signally failed to uh, even repeat the promise, never mind a uh, confirm that it will be implemented. So that seems to me, convener, to be an extremely important point, and I hope the committee will agree. Thank you. And so, if agreement, nonetheless, um, we, the predation, as you put it, Minister, I'm not sure, is that a legal term? But uh, if, if um, those matters could be resolved, um, Cabinet Secretary, forgive me, um, you might still consider there being a Scottish schedule in the UK Agricultural Bill or not. Well, we want to be as cooperative as possible, and, and if we can make progress, that would certainly be welcome. I've had, as well as a face-to-face -face meeting with the Scot, I've, I've uh, discussed this over the telephone with Mr Gove. I mean, I have to say, he's one of the most courteous people I've ever encountered in life. Uh, but in terms of uh, judgment, uh, judgment day, it, we're judged by our deeds, are we not? Not by our words, no matter how courteously uttered they may be. And we are waiting for delivery of promise. Um, I would also say that there is a bigger question that in respect of the Continuity Bill and the Sewell Convention. Uh, it is our belief, uh, Mr Russell's belief, uh, that this Parliament has not been respected. And that's a wider issue that I think really needs to be resolved so that, so that progress can be made. And I imagine Mr Russell would be a be better place convener to explain the, the detail of that. But, you know, we don't feel that this Parliament has been respected either in the Continuity Bill or in the Agri-Fisheries Bill, about which we've uh, generally been consulted more or less at the stroke of midnight. 
uh, and resulting in situations that I would have preferred to have avoided. I, I don't want to have discussions about technicalities. Um, I, I want to get to the meat of the meat of the thing and sort out matters for farmers and crofters uh, and people that work in the rural countryside, including gamekeepers, from which the term predation is probably more applicable than the law courts. Um, merely as a point of um, information, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, uh, have you, can you tell us when it's likely that the, the Supreme Court will rule on the, the continuity bill or not? That's above my pay grade. I see. Right. I take it that you don't know. No, I just wondered if you perhaps you did. Uh, to be, not to be facetious, I, I don't. I don't think we've. I don't think anybody. Anyone? Knows. No. no. I, I don't think they tip, they tip you off or not what they do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and therefore, um, will uh, does the Scottish government think it will be necessary to introduce a Scottish agriculture bill, uh, and when? Well, we we will do everything that's necessary to make sure that. You know, the day-to-day -day management of matters are dealt with. I mean, I spend, as, as I think you know, Mr Scott, um, a lot of time, including a conference call this morning, on CAP IT issues and every week and every day, quite frankly. So I'm really focused on the day job. And as uh, my, my colleague has said, that's been supplemented by Brexit. But, you know, as my old boss used to say, if you want something done, ask a busy person. So we've just got to get on with it and not really whinge too much about it, I guess. Uh, but but uh, having said that, I mean, if we need an Ag Bill, then of course it's up to Cabinet to decide and Parliament to consider. But we will have an Ag Bill, and we've considered this in detail. Uh, there are only limited circumstances in which this would be required. But it would not be a complex matter. It would be a matter of routine legislation, of which we're well familiar in this Parliament, and dealing with things reasonably swiftly. Uh, and moreover, the, we, we, the, the, uh, the deadline within which such a bill would need to be uh, submitted is, is, is not uh, uh, one that would give us any problem at all. For, uh, for 2019, no legislation is needed. For 2020, there may be a small technical issue needed. And 2021 onwards is where we may need a bill for the stability and simplicity approach in our consultation document. Mark Ruskell had a supplementary question. Um, yeah, it was on the, the legal basis for direct support. I mean, you seem to be saying, Mr Ewing, that there is a legal basis for direct support post-2020. I mean, that, that differs to the position of the, the National Farmers Union, who are still concerned about that. Um, well, we've had a detailed engagement with, with the NFUS, uh, and including a meeting with their president, um, Andrew McCormick, with, with whom I have a, a very good working relationship. I'm not sure it's correct to characterise us as having different views. Um, I think uh, Andrew McCormick was assured by the reassurances that I provided him at the meeting when we discussed these matters in detail. Um, there's a sound legal basis for making payments. Uh, it, uh, the, the particular basis will depend upon the particular outcome of Brexit, uh, and uh, I'm not going to begin to speculate but there are three broad scenarios, and in each case, there is a clear legislative basis convener for continuing the payment. So uh, I think rather than the technicalities, and I can confirm in a letter all the technicalities, it would take me about five minutes. But rather than do that now, unless members want to spend the time on this, of course, it's entirely up to you. Um, you know, please, please take it from me. There is no doubt about continuing the payments. The sole issue, I think, to be fair to Mr. Ruskell, which was subject to some debate initially, was whether post-Brexit changes that we may wish to make to CAP, for example, uh, would require legislation in order to give them effect. And the answer is, we think that may be the case, but we have plenty of time to bring in that legislation if required. Uh, and from my part, I would guarantee that anything we need to do to make sure that we've been in a position to make changes, uh, we would certainly do. Uh, and if that included the requirement for legislation, that would be something that obviously I would pursue uh, and I would have to approach it through Cabinet and follow the, the, the procedures for that because it's a Cabinet decision. But, uh, you know, I can say the Scottish Government is determined to do everything that we need to do because 
despite all the argy-bargy about Brexit, which is absolutely serious, nonetheless, we have responsibility to make sure that whatever happens, we are in a position to do our day job. And that's something that I can assure you, Convener, we take with the utmost seriousness. If you, if you were to make changes, the opportunity to consult and design and make further changes is, is, is running away. I mean, there's a limited amount of time if you wanted to put in a new no, subsidy not. system by no, 2020, there's, no, there's not. you have a limited there's amount of time, time to consult on that with stakeholders. Well, the consultation of changes is, is, a, is a different matter, and consultation, consultation is something that we, we almost always do. Uh, and uh, routinely, consultation periods could be six, nine, 12 weeks or, or thereabouts. Uh, but there's no time issue, I can assure members of that. I mean, you know, this, this matter has been raised in, the, in REC as well, and it's been raised in the UK um, committee that Mr. Wishart chairs. Um, perfectly happy, uh, Mr. Barnes can give a very detailed technical explanation if members wish, but uh, I'm in your hands, convener. We'll move. John Scott's got one final question on this before we move on to Stuart Stevenson's questions on fisheries. I'm, I'm just interested in what the shape and the thrust of um, the Scottish Agriculture Bill might be uh, at the time you deem it appropriate to introduce it? Uh, well, we, we're assuming that a bill is, is necessary for the purpose of, of uh, uh, making adjustments post-Brexit to the current CAP. Uh, if that is the bill we're talking about, and that's certainly the, what I, I'm taking from this uh, yes. question session, then that bill would have a very narrow remit. It would be focused on the issue of powers. It wouldn't really discuss the issue of substance. It would be enabling changes to be made, if you like, to the process of the payments, rather than setting out in detail the substance of the policy. Um, we, we have in our paper, Stability and Simplicity, Kavina, which we consulted on over the summer, um, uh, set out various ways in which we, the Scottish Government, suggested uh, might be worthy of serious consideration, namely changing some aspects of the CAP, piloting some changes, and we set out a timescale for that uh, uh, in the document. Um, and uh, we, we would be absolutely able to bring in the legislation necessary to enable those or other changes uh, with ample time so that they can be implemented post-Brexit. Okay. Thank you very much. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Convener, and I want to talk about the fisheries bill uh, that the UK have introduced. And uh, in your introductory remarks, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, you highlighted three things, uh, fishing opportunities, funding for coastal communities, and sea fish. Uh, let me perhaps turn to the fishing opportunities uh, to, to start with. Um, the, the UK fisheries bill um, basically uh, arrogates to the Secretary of State uh, the function of determining UK fishing opportunities in accordance with the UK's international obligations. Um, what's the Scottish Government's understanding of what that means? And let me break that down to explain what I'm asking. Um, is that simply saying that the UK Government is responsible for negotiating with uh, neighbouring states uh, the use of uh, transnational uh, quota allocations, because there's always quota swaps, we know that, the existing system, or is it also about uh, how the quota may be allocated to individual vessels and to individual areas of Scottish waters? In other words, where are the boundaries of the power that the Secretary of State is seeking to take? Well, it's a bit of a technical question. I think I'll probably ask Mr. Um, yeah. Palmer to come in in, uh, a, in um, a, a moment. Um, the bill as drafted, we felt, uh, contained powers with regard to the uh, allocation of quota which appeared to us to predate on the powers of the Scottish Parliament, to take those powers away. It's, uh, use the word predate in that sense. Um, and to be fair to DEFRA and to UK ministers, we pointed this out, and putting it simply, they accepted the argument. So that was a plus, and they 
changed the original wording. So, you know, that illustrates that the process of official to official uh, work has had some res beneficial results. And, and let's recognise that. We're, we, we want to get the job done, you know, not just score points all the time, convener. So, in that respect, we felt that there was there were powers being taken away in relation to the framing of uh, international law and quota and that some progress has been made. But unfortunately, we, we do think that there are other aspects that are still not being resolved in the Fisheries Bill, which we, got, we did get at the last minute. But just so that we can make sure and do justice to Mr Stevenson's question, perhaps I could invite Mr Palmer to answer the rest of the technical parts of it. Yes, yeah, certainly. As the Cabinet Secretary said, um, uh, we did manage to improve that part of the bill. It happens to be Section 18 of the bill. Um, uh, and the drafting is better, we think, in terms of protecting devolved competence, but it's still not quite there in terms of what we feel impinges on devolved competence, because there's a distinction between the reserve function, which is to make the international agreement, and then the compliance and the implementation of that international agreement, um, which, uh, from our point of view, is clearly a devolved function and a devolved competence. And there remains some wording in the bill that, for example, says that the Secretary of State um, uh, may determine fishing opportunities um, for different areas of sea. We are concerned that that may lead to the Secretary of State being able to determine uh, quota limits, for example, for Clyde Herring uh, or Orkney Crab. Um, and uh, uh, that would clearly impinge upon devolved competence in our view. Um, we are still discussing this um, with DEFRA, and I should stress, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that our discussions have been positive and constructive. So um, we are hoping that we can find a resolution to this, but it still remains a point of difference between us. Uh, so just, just to confirm, and the example that uh, you used, Mr Palmer, was Clyde Herring, and of course they're Herring elsewhere. Um, is it the case, therefore, that at present the Scottish Government determines um, the balance of quota for Clyde Herring versus Herring elsewhere in an overall framework that covers the totality of Herring in Scottish waters? So what happens at present is that um, it's the European Union um, uh, uh, in negotiation um, across the member states that will decide quota limits and, and total allowable catches across all of these stocks. Um, in terms of the Clyde Herring, uh, Scottish ministers have a delegated function there um, uh, to, to work with the Uni European Union to determine um, uh, that quota limit. Now, obviously, post EU exit, we are we will then be moving into a situation where those will not those limits will not be determined by the European Union, and so we're we're, we're concerned about where the well, competence should lie. There, uh, so, sorry, I'm perhaps my mind is working in quite a simple way, and I'm not clear. The, the at present, the UK get and Scotland gets an allocation of herrick. But who decides which of the areas that there are to which quota are allocated? Who decides that? Is that the European Union who says uh, 4A gets that, 4B gets that, or 7, or four, the different areas around the coast? Or is that something the Scottish Government does within an overall framework of the species to be caught uh, within our waters? So the, U the, the, the UK delegation, led by the Secretary of State, will decide what the UK-wide total allowable catch is for each stock, right across the UK. Um, there is then a process of allocation um, across the UK, which works according to very well-established administrative rules of how that uh, quota should be distributed uh, across the UK. Um, and uh, you, would be, you would imagine there's a lot of sensitivity about respecting those rules. Um, uh, what we're concerned to do in relation to the Fisheries Bill is to protect the Scottish interests in terms of devolved competence, um, in terms of how international determinations are then administered and implemented within the UK. Uh you, you mentioned administrative rules that basically break down the overall UK allocation into the areas of water. Does the bill that's uh, before the UK Parliament uh, affect 
the operation of those administrative rules at all? No, no, it doesn't touch on so, that. So, so therefore, if the UK sets what the overall limits are going to be, although presumably there will be external negotiation associated with that, um, that, that the allocation to Scottish waters, put the process of allocation remains unchanged. Right, okay, that's, I think, modestly helpful. Um, can I just move on, Cabinet Secretary, to uh, the issue of funding uh, for com communities, which uh, you raised in your opening remarks, and uh, to the extent to which the UK Fisheries Bill uh, touches upon that matter? Well, the, at, at the present time, um, the EU funds through the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, a very substantial amount of funding, which is used for a diverse range of purposes, for helping small businesses, for example, in processing, acquire you know, ice-making facilities, for example, uh, for ports and harbours to affect improvements, for various uh, qualifying projects for companies and other applicants throughout the country. The point I want to make is that the UK government <coughs> has not implemented the promise which promises which were made in the run-up to the Brexit referendum that the EU funding would be at least matched. And the EU funding in fishing is largely EMFF and in agriculture is largely the, um, the uh, a CAP. And, you know, putting it in context, convener, I mean, in terms of uh, rural funding, we're talking in the period of 214 to 220 from the EU, funding of £5,000 million from the EU. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, that was funding which uh, um, was promised. I mean, here we are, here's Mr Eustace. Farmers will be better off if we leave the EU. Better off. So, uh, and there's also specific quotes. I won't go through them all, but... I can provide them if, if you wish. So the point I'm making is a very simple one. You know, before the referendum, there were promises made, but we haven't had promises about the MFF. And that's been absolutely crucial for fisheries and the development of fisheries, the development of capacity in companies, improvement of harbours all around the country, uh, and absolutely essential to enable these vital projects to, to go ahead. I have proposed an amendment on funding to ensure Scottish ministers uh, get at least current EMFF monies, and that, that convener will be a matter for the UK government to, to, uh, uh, to, to debate. Uh, colleagues will develop funding on more broadly based shortly. Just one final small uh, item. You mentioned sea fish, uh, which is essentially a levy uh, which is uh, taken to the UK in which we uh, get a limited share back. Does the uh, fisheries bill touch on the issue of uh, sea fish levies and, and uh, is it your intention that it should do if it doesn't currently? Uh, well, the answer is no, it doesn't. But again, we've put an amendment, but perhaps Mr Palmer, who has helped draft it, uh, might explain what it is. Yes, so um, at the moment, we, we believe that there is a mission, an omission in the fisheries bill um, uh, with regard to um, the sea fish levy. Um, the Scottish Government has, um, for a number of years now, um, uh, been requesting the UK Government um, uh, uh, to uh, devolve levy, levy raising powers um, uh, to Scotland. Uh, so we have proposed an amendment um, uh, uh, to the bill um, which would provide um, the Seafish um, Industry Authority, which is the authority which administers the levy, with greater flexibility to exercise its functions separately and differently in different parts of the UK. Um, uh, so um, this, would, uh, this amendment would int introduce a new clause um, which would um, amend the Fisheries Act 1981, which uh, is the act that enshrines Seafish, um, uh, and that would um, allow that authority to exercise its functions separately in different parts of the UK um, uh, uh, and in consequence of that um, uh, there would be greater flexibility for the way in which the levy operates in Scotland to be distinct to the way in which it operates in the rest of the UK. Um, 
And we, would, we are also proposing um, uh, a new clause uh, which would require the, uh, the Seafish Authority to appoint a committee for the purpose of assisting that authority in the exercise of its functions in relation, in relation to seafish industry in Scotland so that we would have um, uh, a statutory committee that would be tailored towards Scottish needs and circumstances in terms of how, how that part of the levy um, is, uh, is delivered for Scotland. Okay. I may have a short supplementary question from Finn Carson on this issue. Thank you, Convener. On the back of uh, the UK becoming an in independent coastal state when we leave uh, Europe, uh, we've heard about uh, fishing efforts, quotas and total allowable, allowable catches. Is it still the fact that uh, whatever the quota uh, levels are decided, Marine Scotland will still have the ability or c control the licences for who actually can fish within Scottish waters? Yes, that's correct. Um, th that remains a devolved function. So most of fisheries management, almost all of fisheries management is a devolved function, including licensing, okay. and that will remain devolved. Thank you. I'd like to move on to questions around funding, questions for, for both Cabinet Secretaries, because obviously uh, the current EU funding streams affect both portfolios massively. We've mentioned CAP, EMFF, but also Horizon 2020, Life Structural Funds, European Territorial Cooperation Funding. Um, these have massive implications for, for um, agriculture, fish, fishing, but also the environment as well. Um, can, can I ask... Um, if I, if I take um, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, first of all, what effect the lack of certainty around funding for, for example, R&D might have on um, you know, issues around how the portfolio for, for uh, rural economy and connectivity works with the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform around issues around environmental issues um, in, in Scotland, and how, how that funding, if it's, if it's not guaranteed, if replacement funding is not guaranteed, what implications that might have? Um, uh, fairly significant implications, which uh, I think we've been flagging up for some time. Um, there's been uh, a fair amount of recent uh, publicity uh, around Horizon 2020 um, uh, in respect to the reliance of Scottish universities uh, on that, which can vary from institution to institution. Uh, but uh, on average, it makes up about 10% of their total research income. So that would be uh, a big uh, collapse uh, in that. And uh, I'm right in saying that the uh, various research institutes, which are not actually part of the university structure, are similarly um, uh, dependent on access to Horizon. We have information already that research proposals uh, that involve uh, a UK and in our case a Scottish um, uh, component are just not getting off the ground because from an uh, external perspective it's going to cause an issue and therefore they're just not getting anywhere mm -hmm. uh, as a result of that. So Horizon 2020 um, is, is particularly important to Scotland because actually because of the really good performance of our research institutes and research bodies um, we tend to get a higher level of income um, from Horizon 2020 as a result. Uh, so uh, it works out at 55 euros per capita compared with a UK average of 40 euros per capita. So you can see there's quite a distinctive uh, difference. Um, so th that's an important consideration because even were funding in some way to be agreed, at the moment, we get a disproportionately higher level of that funding. And is that going to be agreed? Because if that's not agreed, then we're going to see a, a drop anyway, uh, which, which, is a big, uh, uh, which is a big concern. Um, so uh, there's, there's also uh, a kind of slightly more um, indirect uh, risk, which is that loss of EU funding <laughs> is also taking people out of networks. Um, uh, and I you know, give some examples of where, where joint funding projects are just not going ahead if there's a, if there's a Scottish or indeed a, a UK component. So you're, you're, you're then losing the network of research. And research is now done 
you know, across boundaries. It's very rare for it to be entirely uh, taking place entirely within one institution in one country. You're always going to have uh, partners. So that's a, 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 big, a big concern. Um, uh, there's also um, other issues that uh, have to do with other uh, um, bits of, uh, of funding. We've got, um, uh, you know, uh, Fergus Ewing talked about um, the CAP uh, um, being important for both portfolios, and that is the case because obviously it also funds agri-environment schemes. So that's not necessarily about research, but that's actually about practical schemes uh, on, on the ground, um, uh, and that's really, really important to us. There's a European Regional Development Funding, which um, goes to SNH for the Green Infrastructure Strategic Intervention Programme. That's around £41.6 million. Pounds. There's a European Re Regional Development Funding that goes to Zero Waste Scotland um, uh, to support resource efficiency and the circular economy, and that's around £26.4 uh, million. Pounds. Um, so uh, it, it, it all begins to add up across um, a number of programmes uh, impacting in a number of areas uh, and, and will um, uh, be a considerable uh, loss um, to Scotland if there aren't real guarantees. Now, there are some uh, uh, guarantees, and I think uh, the, at the moment, as I understand it, the guarantees uh, are... Um, up to, uh, well, included within the 2014-2020 EU budget plan. Once you get past that, uh, you're into more of a no-man's land um, uh, in terms of where things might go. Um, the, there is, as I understand it, um, a shared prosperity fund, um, which has been flagged up by the UK government, which I think is meant to somehow... Uh, uh, bring a lot of this under its umbrella uh, but uh, thus far um, despite reassurances that devolved administrations would be involved in the development that thus far that's not actually happened so we really don't know yet what that means what the, the calculations would be in terms of what it would cover um, and as I indicated at the start of this the the recognition that Scotland punches well above its weight in being able to access funding. Uh, therefore, uh, it isn't just about getting a share. Will we continue to get the share that we have been managing to get up until now? So in, in both, both your portfolios, you obviously identified quite a lot of areas where EU funding has not, there's not a guarantee of being replaced. <clears throat> what, what action have you been taking in order to put these points to the UK government um, around re replacement of this funding. And given that, the, uh, obviously, you've been, for two years, you've been asking for this, a guarantee for this funding to be replaced, but given that you've not had answers on that and guarantees, what are you preparing to do in the event of not having those guarantees fulfilled? Well, you know, the, the, U, the UK government would be responsible for, as the paymaster following the EU. Um, and we, what have we been doing? We, we have been pressing this issue, myself and my colleague Rosanna Cunningham, um, from the Brexit day, uh, the Brexit referendum day, uh, and we've been doing so um, in a concerted fashion and at numerous meetings which um, either or both of us have attended um, with Mr Gove, Mr Eustace and other ministers, and Mrs Ledson before him, face to uh, face. We've also asked for an amendment to the Agriculture Bill to guarantee funding. Um, I mean, after all, there, you know, there's umpteen quotes. The, George Eustace said the UK government will continue to give farmers and the environment as much support or perhaps even more as they get now. Farmers Guardian, 26th of May 2016. Now, you know, you know Robert Burns said in gathering votes you wear in the slack, now stand as tightly by your tack and a claw you the auger, fidge your back and hum and haw, but tell your crack before them all. I.e., after the voting, you've got to fulfill your promises. So what we're doing is saying, do what you promised you would do. Now, I mean, on EMF, there's 243 in the UK, 107.7 comes to Scotland. Um, of that, I mean, Peterhead got five million for its, uh, for its uh, project, M big, big project, major project, 1.7 million for the pier in Westry, 900,000 for Seafood Scotland to showcase 
our produce international trade shows. 6.5 million to fisheries local action groups throughout the, the country. 2.5 million to aquaculture innovation. Um, the only thing we know about the UK Prosperity Fund is those three words. So, you know, what are they doing? What are they playing at? We've been pressing this uh, convener eyeball to eyeball, person to person, face-to-face, uh, -face, letter, endless letters. Uh, and although, you know, we have received some limited assurances, they'll really only take us either to 222 or, in the case of, of uh, non-farm support payment, non-farm support Pillar 2 payments to 2020. Uh, the EU funding schemes are in a seven-year tranche, 2014-20, 2020 to 27. And that seven-year is not an accident. It's because the EU, I think, recognises that in fishing and farming, investments are long-term. You know, you can't plan on a year-to-year -year basis. You need to take a longer-term view. So, um, so I, I do think we have argued the Scottish cause uh, 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 in detail, and rightly so, for you know, hill farmers, for our fishermen, um, for the environmental schemes, for forestry, which is, is waiting for assurances, quite frankly, uh, despite the fact we do about 80-90% uh, of the forestry in Scotland. Uh, uh, and some, at some point, you, you know, maybe after, if they ever go over the Brexit wrangling that's going on at the moment, they're going to have to focus on the day job. And in this situation where you, you do get a guarantee and you're able to make plans for, for new payment schemes, uh, is it in the Scottish Government's intention to maintain funding for climate and biodiversity projects under the CAP scheme? Should we have that guarantee of the replacement funding? This, this funding at the moment comes from the EU. That's mm -hmm. where it comes from. Yeah. You know, we can't magic up money. If it's uh -huh. taken away by the UK government because they, they don't implement the promises, then the responsibility will very clearly lie on those who made false promises, who over-promised to get votes for Brexit. That's where the response... We can't magic up uh -huh. money, convener. Yeah. I can't say, and it would be absolutely rash of me to say, that somehow I would find money, which we've taken, we've taken as read, will be there from the EU because uh, we, we've had the benefit of the con contribution. We can't magic up money if it turns out that the UK Welsh is on its promises post-Brexit. So, so without that guarantee, you can't make a commitment towards biodiversity programmes? Well, what we can do is guarantee that we'll pass on money that we receive yeah. to beneficiaries. Of course we okay. do that, and we have done that as a matter of fact, but we can't pass on money that we don't get. No, yeah. and, and can I just make the point, I mean, I, 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 I flagged up the, the disparity, the, the, the higher proportion of Horizon 2020 funding that we get for research institutes in Scotland, for research in Scotland, compared to south of the border, but the global sums of money are actually quite significant. The, the current Horizon 2020 programme runs 2014 to 2020, and um, since it launched in 2014, over 533 million euros worth of funding has been secured by Scottish organisations to date. That's the, the, the scale of what we're talking about. Now, that isn't... How, how do you step in and replace that amount of funding? It, it, it isn't really, you know, an easy thing to do unless you are drawing down money from a different source. Mm. And at the moment, there is no obvious different source that is going to deliver on that same scale. Um, maybe this shared prosperity fund is going to be it, but we don't know, and there is no guarantee. And I've indicated that already we are losing potential research contracts as a result. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, could I ask you, um, uh, from an environmental perspective, Cabinet Secretary, if you have, um, like myself, particular concerns, um, although... There, there are major concerns about all the funding issues, um, about the, the life um, uh, funding streams, particularly in view of what's been highlighted to me by RSPB and other organisations, that um, these are projects where, such as in the Shant Islands, you need the, a considerable amount, significant amounts of money at one time in order to tackle something like removing the black rats, which has been very successful. Um, and I just wonder, in terms of a particular block of funding at a particular time, if, if there are particular concerns about life. Yes, uh, I mean, there are issues around life uh, funding. It's one of the smaller 
uh, segments. It does. It's not of the scale of Horizon 2020. Um, since uh, uh, it, it, up until now, uh, in that same 2014-2020 budget period, um, the Scottish organisations we think have received around 9.1 million pounds in, in life uh, funding and. Uh, uh, I mean, SNH has received funding for habitats and species work, which will be getting, you know, uh, uh, spent out there. Um, there are also partner projects that uh, involve SEPA um, uh, and uh, that Life Plus programme is, for example, helping on uh, throughout the uh, Scotland, uh, Central Scotland Green Network. So there's, there's a lot of smaller um, packets of money which are, are, are currently being drawn down from Europe that are very significant. Another one I didn't mention, of course, was Interreg. Um, so it's spread over quite a few areas. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, isn't, it isn't just the money, because the money is incredibly important, but it's not just the money. It's the relationships that you, you, you begin to be impacted negatively once you're no longer part of this process. Um, because a lot of the projects that get set up will involve others from other places. If you if you go to uh, any one of the research institutes, the numbers of um, uh, young scientists that come from across the whole of Europe to work in a lot of the work that's being done is quite noticeable, um, and it's worrying. I think how that future will look if we begin to see them disappearing. SRDP, obviously hugely important for catchment level work between farmers, meeting environmental objectives. Uh, are you able to guarantee funding SRDP program up to the end of the transition period? And given that you have got a period now where you're looking at bringing forward a Scottish agriculture bill, presumably you'll be looking at how SRDP is delivered as part of that as well. Um, just to flag up the, the figures again, the agro-environment schemes under the SRDP uh, uh, are around uh, £308 million uh, in that same 2014-2020 uh, funding period. Um, uh, I would love to be able to say that we could simply match that if it disappears, but the truth is I can't say that. So, um, uh, And that's really uh, within that 2014-2020 period. Um, what's the current state of the transition goes up to when? I don't know. Well, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the guarantees we've received, convener, and this is a mat matter of record, is that Cap Pillar 1 payments for the 2019-20 scheme year, Cap Pillar 2 contracts, excluding, technic excluding technical assistance, uh, entered into by the end of 2020. Now, that means there's no guarantee or certainty for, um, a, for farm support um, because the UK government commitment is to maintain the same cash total in funds for farm support until 2022. So that begs the question of what is farm support? Is forestry farm support? I don't think so. Is AICS, the AICS scheme farm support? I wouldn't have thought so. There's an argument. So the terminology used by the Treasury of this distinction about farm support really is not one that has clarity for the purposes of the variety of schemes under Pillar 2, some of which have an element of, if you like, supporting activity in farms, but perhaps designed primarily for other things, such as key environmental things, alleviation of flooding, for example, or in forestry is, is not really, I don't think, directed primarily to farm support. So, um, so really, after 220, and projects into, entered into prior to 220, there's really no investor certainty. And the trouble about that is that an awful lot of, certainly the forestry schemes, and I, I think it's the case in the environmental schemes, are long-term projects. Mm. They're conceived in a long term, over a number of years. And therefore, long-term investor certainty is, is just a, a sine qua non for any investment decision. So I think that we're now seeing the impairment of investment decisions as a, a likely, increasingly likely scenario, unless the UK Treasury decide to provide clearer guarantees than they have done at the moment. And in any event, the guarantees only take us up to 2022. We don't, uh, for that's only for Pillar 1. Uh, we really have no idea what's happening after that, except that the Treasury have said that direct payments for farmers have to stop by 2027. So the only thing we know for sure 
is that the UK Treasury want to stop the direct payments which farmers came to expect from Europe and were promised by Mr Eustace and Mr Gove they would continue to receive after Brexit. John Scott. Sorry, we need to move on. John Scott. Um, thank you, um, convener. Um, Cabinet the Secretary, I'm just trying to suggest you're making... Sorry? Secretary. Um, Mr one. Ewing, um, <laughs> I would venture to suggest you're making quite a lot of, of uncertainty and don't really want to get into an exchange with, with uh, Burns quotes with you, but I would refer you to Allouse and the suggestion it would some power the gift to give us the power to see ourselves as others see us. It would for money a blunder free us and foolish notion. So just say, I think you're overemphasizing might I suggest uh, the uncertainty beyond uh, 2022 uh, and 2020. There is no certainty, as I understand it, in Europe beyond 2020. Um, and therefore, uh, nor is there a requirement for there to be certainty at this time beyond 2022. Um, uh, when is it an assurance, not an assurance, from my understanding and certainly my knowledge and experience of the UK government, particularly the current UK government, when they make an insurance, they have every intention, good intention, of adhering to it. So I'll just make that point. Perfect. So not a question then. OK, we'll move on to questions <laughs> on a no-deal scenario from Finlay Carson. Thank you, convener. Uh, what are the key environmental risks of a no-deal and what is the government doing to assess and uh, manage those risks? You're wanting environmental risks. Yes. Well, there are, there are a number of um, concerns that we have uh, about some issues uh, on a no deal on a, for day one readiness. Um, now, you know, what we've tried to do is map the most significant ones. Um, and one of those, for example, is uh, waste shipment. Uh, with a no deal, no plans, there's a risk that a no deal exit and new customs controls could stop or slow down waste shipments. And you would begin to see uh, the implications of that backing up uh, uh, um, uh, here quite quickly. The other issue is on chemicals regulation, uh, where um, uh, there's an issue about... Uh, wanting to avoid barriers to trade and ensuring an effective regulatory system, um, a no deal effectively doesn't have that in place at that point. Um, and there are some real issues about unsafe materials entering Scotland. Um, I've also um, raised with DEFRA, and I did so at the most recent DEFRA devolved administrations meeting, um, the issue of the cross-cutting trade and customs rules and I appreciate these are not all decisions these are not all decisions being made by DEFRA itself um, they too are subject to some of the concerns that would uh, uh, emerge um, around freight transport and shipping now I had raised that at the DEFRA DA meeting in Cardiff some weeks ago and I noticed there's now been some stuff in the public domain that appears to have come out of a cabinet conversation around this very, um, this very issue. But that would obviously um, impact on us as well, including, again, back to waste shipments and importing and export, um, exporting chemicals. So th th the issue is around protecting supply chains um, and ensuring that imports and exports can continue in the event of a no-deal exit. Uh, so those are the key things that we've looked at at the moment. I'm not going to pretend that's an exhaustive list, but we are trying to prioritise the ones that would be impacted most quickly from terms of my portfolio. Um, uh, I think food uh, is the issue perhaps in the other uh, portfolio. Um, and uh, uh, the other issue is just ensuring uh, enforcement powers of public bodies on day one. Um, and there are some issues that have arisen in respect of water, uh, which I think have been fairly widely uh, rehearsed in the press, which has to do with um, uh, the treatment, the way we treat water at the moment and the chemicals that are required to do that. Um, but I don't pretend to be an expert on, on, uh, on that water treatment. Uh, um, but as I understand it, it's very dependent on chemicals being imported from the EU. So we're back to chemicals 
and ability to get stuff in uh, on day one. So these are the things that we have to kind of think about uh, in terms of being ready for day one. In some cases, there's a bit of stockpiling can go on. So Scottish water can hold several weeks of key supplies. So that might be an answer in some places, but it won't necessarily be an answer, for example, if we can't get waste shipped to where it normally goes, it will begin to pile up uh, in Scotland. So, you know, these are all the things that we're trying to struggle with on the basis of there being a no deal. Um, when I go back to what I said right at the start, of course, all of the planning and all of the trying to get ready for the no deal, if there is a deal, or if we end up not Brexiting, will have been a considerable amount of work done for nothing. Mm. Uh, can I ask you if, what the Scottish Government is doing to, to keep track of the additional functions and powers that will come uh, to Scotland uh, and or fall to the Scottish Ministers or statutory organisations in the case of a no deal? Well, if I can answer that just in respect of, uh, of the Fisheries Bill, there are minor respects in which it is being argued that we will acquire additional powers, and these are of a technical nature. Um, we believe we already, through other means, if effectively in practice, deal with these matters already, so that would not involve any um, additional imposition. And in the Ag Bill, the reverse is the case. It's being, uh, it's being uh, proposed that powers be removed from this Parliament, not, uh, uh, not conferred upon this Parliament. So we're currently using the SI consent notifications process as a tracker. Um, uh, we're not, we haven't set up a separate kind of set up for it. We, we're, we're using the consent notification process itself. Um, in, in the majority of cases, functions will be able to be exercised by ministers in respect of Scotland and by the Secretary of State in respect of the UK, where we consent. Um, there may be some instances where a consistent and coherent UK-wide approach is the most appropriate uh, way forward. Uh, um, and that may be in relation to chemicals and some of the, the, the regimes uh, that might need to be in place. Um, uh, but it's, uh, um, I mean, it's a constantly evolving scenario. The, the Scottish Government relying on the, the UK Government to, to track the additional functions or powers that may be coming? No, not necessarily. I mean, we're, we're, we're working through the consent notifications and we're using that as the basis on which, you know, we're making it uh, uh, understanding what will continue to be exercisable here as opposed to Westminster. I mean, that's, so it's not really relying on somebody else. It's just this is the process that is working between the two governments at the moment. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to talk about uh, common frameworks, and I, I take that both of you have, have made um, mention of common frameworks and any kind of regulatory alignment in your opening statements. Um, I've got a particular question for Fergus Ewing, because it strikes me that regardless of what the common frameworks are across the UK with regard to any kind of like movement of, of, of trade across the UK, a lot of that's going to depend, in terms of like food and, and, and food production, is going to depend on the international trade agreements that the UK government may make with other countries. And where, what, what locus does the Scottish government have in those decisions around those, those trade agreements that are presumably, maybe, being made as we speak? Well, sadly, the, the, whilst we seek to play a partnership role in respect of these matters, the, the UK government take the view that these are, these are are reserve matters in which they deal with, uh, and therefore they don't seek to involve us. For example, uh, in the negotiations and the political declaration um, and the Brexit deal in respect of fishing, where uh, aquaculture and fish will be excluded from the backstop, we, we learnt about that uh, after it was uh, negotiated by the, by the UK. Um, there's a particular pressing problem, actually, for um, trade at trade, and the, the question really is about trade. As far as foodstuffs uh, go, as far as, um, as far as fish go, and I'm thinking in particular of shellfish and so on, fresh and perishable with a very short life, um, the, in, in the event of a no deal, the, uh, uh, the, we, we understand 
uh, there is a requirement for the UK to obtain a specific permission for the continuance of any exports whatsoever. Uh, and in order for every business to be able to continue to be allowed to export, they require to register certain information, quite a lot of information actually, with the Food Standards Scotland or in the UK with the FSA. Uh, and that this will, uh, this information which has just been imparted by the FSS in Scotland to uh, relevant businesses must be provided uh, within fairly short order, I think by Wednesday of next week, although it's been explained that that deadline is not one enshrined in law. So on a very practical basis, businesses at this time of year convener are being asked to amass an enormous amount of information, uh, stipulating every consignment of produce that they've done. For some companies, that will be tens of thousands of consignments. Uh, we're also concerned about export certification. If Britain is a third country, in, a, as it will become, then a, a, a exporters of food, particularly perishable food, will be faced with uh, having to satisfy the requirements of the EU in respect of border inspection points and certification. And we estimate that in respect of aquaculture, this could lead to, I think we're talking about 40, 45,000 uh, certificates. So in short, we would wish a formal place given to Scotland in international fisheries agreements and negotiations involving food and drink and agriculture. Uh, and you know, with respect, the last point I'll make is that you know, some of our officials, for example, involved in fisheries negotiations, are regarded as amongst the most professional, best qualified and informed and able in the whole of the EU, and certainly know far more about Scottish fish uh, than their counterparts down south, because they're steeped in it day to day. So we're ready to play a positive uh, and progressive part in international trade deals, whether you know, whether or not Brexit happens, actually. But if Brexit were to happen, it becomes particularly important that the Scottish voice is heard in an informed and an effective way. It's, it's, not, it's not just around trade. The trade agreements also might have an impact on acceptable food standards of, of this, the, the kind of food that are, we're, we're importing from countries that we previously haven't had ag ag agreements with. How do you think that might impact on, on the agriculture sector in terms of, we've all heard about the chlorinated chicken, for example. We've heard about the, the types of, of meat that might come into to, to the UK that previous, uh, previously haven't had a, a route into our markets. How might that affect the, the ordinary say, beef producer in, in Scotland? Very substantially indeed, and I should explain we have sought a, an amendment uh, on that, but it hasn't been accepted. And, you know, it just is, is a matter of practicalities. The, the process of exporting, whether it's uh, uh, you know, whether it's beef, whether it's, it's uh, fish, whether it's farm fish, um, y you know, there, there, there are well-recognised uh, logistical, logistical patterns using, um, using trucks, ports, in some cases airplanes, and these are all time critical uh, in almost all cases, particularly in respect of perishable goods, obviously, where the, a loss of a few hours could mean that shellfish becomes valueless. Um, so that's one worry. Another worry, convener, is that uh, you know, were Brexit to happen and Britain becomes a third country, well, many of the EU countries have their own shellfish sectors, their own beef sectors. And you know, one could imagine that they would give preference to their sectors in respect of technical issues about the, the correct process of uh, importation of uh, Scottish produce. Uh, and that, that could cause very practical problems. I know that, for example, the, the uh, a representative of the Scottish Creelfish Creel Federation has spoken out very clearly about these issues and would affect the, particularly Mr Carson's constituency and, and others, I expect, uh, about the risks that you've outlined being very practical and very real ones. So, I mean, part of our job is, is to prepare for the, for the worst whilst hoping for the best. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the Food Standards Scotland is involved quite heavily in that at the moment. Okay, and, and moving on to environmental standards, the Scottish and question for, for uh, Cabinet Secretary for the Environment. Are Scottish Government and UK Government in agreement about where powers to set environmental standards lie? It's currently obviously set by the European Commission, but the post-Brexit scenario, are all the policy areas in the event of a no deal, have we got any guarantees about if they're going to be coming to the Scottish Government or...? Is that still been something I don't, that's I been... don't think I would argue that there are any actual guarantees uh, uh, about anything at the moment. Um, uh, where there is uh, 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 agreement 
is uh, whether there's agreement between both governments about where powers to set environmental standards lie. There's broad agreement that they will return to Scotland, if that's where they've come from, um, through the current joint SI programme. That's, that's the broad agreement. Um, but there are a number of areas where there's a real disagreement between us and the UK government um, about the split between uh, reserved and devolved competence. And I've just written to the committee about CITES uh, as being uh, one of those uh, areas where there is a difference of opinion uh, in respect of uh, devolved and reserved. Um, and uh, I've you know, obviously written to UK ministers making the uh, position clear. So at the moment, while there's a kind of broad agreement in principle and practice, assertions are being made about what is devolved, what is reserved, that aren't necessarily uh, um, uh, decisions that we agree with, and that will continue to be uh, uh, that will continue to be uh, an issue. Um, uh, in respect of the broader issue of uh, environmental uh, quality, uh, some issues around environmental quality are subject to uh, framework discussions as well. Um, but I need to make it clear that, that neither, I think, with uh, the rural economy or with this portfolio, no actual frameworks have been agreed at all. So the conversations have been going ahead. Uh, in my portfolio, there's discussions about um, uh, um, uh, frameworks on chemicals, uh, two on environmental quality, one about waste and producer responsibility, one about ozone depleting substances and F gases. And of course, the fourth one, the one about which the committee has taken quite a lot of evidence in the EU ETS, which is not a DEFRA related one, it's a BASE related one. Um, so, you know, um, conversations, yes, no actual agreement on frameworks, no actual agreement yet on how, if there is a framework, how that is to work. Um, I mean, it can't simply be, uh, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a framework if there isn't an equality sitting around the table in terms of the framework. And, and so those are still fundamental issues that, that are bedeviling even those areas. Um, even those areas where, you know, on EU ETS, for example, I've been banging on the door about a framework for nearly two years now. Uh, so, you know, come on, we, we could have done this already if, if there'd been any, you know, response from, uh, from Bayes that was in any way meaningful. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, if I could turn to um, the issue of environmental governance. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment for the letter that we received um, yesterday, uh, which gave us clarification on uh, environmental governance. Now, before we explore the detail of the letter further, um, I was wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could advise the committee about the, the latest discussions uh, with the UK Government and other devolved administrations regarding a potential single UK governance body. Uh, if, if well, there is no proposal yet for a single UK government body, and I think that needs to be made clear. Um, the, the, the DEFRA proposal uh, is for uh, um, England only, because both Wales and Scotland asked to be removed from that, because it was a case of something being effectively advised to us within 24 hours of publication. Um, with no actual discussion prior to that of how anything like that would work. So, um, uh, so DEFRA are, are proposing to consult on... So I don't think... I don't, not actually consulting yet, but they're proposing to consult on this single body for England only. Um, DEFRA will be laying draft legislative clauses on that before the end of the year in line with the EU Withdrawal Act. Please yeah. excuse me, committee. We're, we're still a little uncertain in respect of that. And, and it kind of goes back to uh, the thing I referred to on, on frameworks, because, you know, um, uh, any UK-wide body would have to accept equality of membership of that body. And there lies the rub, often, with an awful lot of what emanates from Westminster. Um, uh, so uh, uh, at the moment, the... the 
the projected consultation that we have doesn't start with, here's the proposal, now we're going to consult on it. It will work on the basis of uh, getting people to, uh, um, to respond on the basis of what is required, uh, and, and we will use that consultation to then, um, uh, to then develop uh, a longer term uh, um, proposal if that is necessary, but there will also be some issues that are required in the very short to medium term. So it, it's, uh, you know, the, the proposal that is coming from DEFRA will not be there on day one, will not be there, you know, even if they do stick to the timetable of their environment bill and all the rest of it is unlikely to be in place for a couple of years down the line anyway. So. And they will have the same day one issues that we will have. And I'm not at all clear what they're doing in terms of day one issues. I don't know if Katrina knows. No, not really. No. But, I mean, fr frameworks, if I may just, just make a general point, they, they don't mean uniformity across the UK. I think there's, there's a danger of the term framework kind of contains an implicit assumption that somehow they will be designed to ensure uniformity of policy application throughout the UK. I mean, fisheries and... The, and the environment and agriculture are devolved. So we do things differently here, and Parliament's agreed. For example, less favoured area schemes is something in Scotland that still is extremely important, vital, um, I, for constituents of Mr McDonald's native heath, for example. Uh, and an 85% of the landmass in Scotland is Elfast, but they decided to, to stop that particular scheme convener seven years ago down south. So that's just one example, one obvious example. But frameworks don't mean uniformity, but they do mean dealing with things like state aid and internal market and how it applies. So, uh, so the key for me is that these should be agreed but not imposed upon the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. Okay, thanks. Um, if I could go back, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to the uh, consultation. Um, in, in your letter, um, you've given us notice that uh, the consultation will be delayed. Um, however, you mentioned earlier this morning that that would be for a, a brief period. Um, now you'll, you'll probably find this uh, question uh, somewhat infuriating, but can you give us um, an indication of how brief is brief? I, I'll tell you what one of the problems is. So um, uh, <coughs> there was no advance warning from the UKG um, of the proposals in the backstop protocol for, and I quote, an independent and adequately resourced body or bodies uh, in respect of environmental governance. So we knew nothing about that. We knew nothing about it until we were basically confronted with it. So officials are currently engaging with DEFRA um, on its plans for legislation uh, to establish a governance body for England and reserve matters only, but also to try and bottom out what's actually meant by that phrase in uh, um, in the backstop protocol. So we need to get a little bit of clarity in and around some of this. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the, the delay in the consultation is, I'm not talking about six months, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, um, a relatively short period of time while we try to get further clarity on some of this, you know, which appeared with no advance warning or consultation. Okay, thanks. And, and clearly you'll have to look at... Um uh, new engagement proposals. So um, I was wondering how do you plan to how do you plan to engage with stakeholders, including the statutory agencies, uh, to develop plans for environmental government. Well, there's considerable engagement already happening. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, the consultation will be an engagement in its in itself, uh, but uh, it, it itself is built on. Uh, um, Round the roundtable work that was done uh, prior to this. Um, we're engaging across the public sector with bodies like SEPA and SNH in the development of the consultation. Um, and we've also uh, ensured that wider stakeholder interests have been engaged with on an informal basis. And that's been going on throughout the summer um, and autumn so that they know what's happening, they understand uh, what's, uh, what's uh, going on. Um, and some of that work has been uh, uh, has been very consistent over uh, uh, over that lengthy period of time. So uh, that engagement is already in place. Um, and I, I don't think anything 
that we are discussing is going to come as a huge surprise to stakeholders because they have been pretty much engaged in the conversation with us all the way along. And one final question with regard to, again, with the, the consultation, um, are you considering the option uh, of other new Scottish institutions, uh, such as introducing an environmental court or a tribunal? Um, I believe, uh, if memory serves me correctly, an uh, uh, environmental court was in the SNP manifesto a couple of elections ago. Well, I can't speak to the manifesto a couple of elections ago. I mean, obviously, we've still got to finalise the consultation paper. Um, uh, it will have to cover general questions about the longer-term future of uh, um, enforcement needs. Um, uh, but any uh, such, uh, such proposal could not be in place, you know, immediately. So uh, my concern is to ensure that people focus also in what's needed in the short and medium term as well and make sure that everybody is thinking across the board uh, on that um, uh, as we will continue to try and engage uh, um, with DEFRA about anything that they are talking about at a UK level and clarifying what they mean in that backstop protocol. There has been recent... Um a recent suggestion that uh, um, environmental court could be tagged on to the, the land court, for example. But I'm just Do you know what? I mean, the, the, the danger is if everybody rushes to the end point, everybody forgets that there's a period starting potentially on the on the on the 29th of March this coming year that will we will need to immediately try to 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 manage um, and into that into that shorter and, and medium term. So some of the long-term proposals would take a considerable amount of work. Uh, um, uh, and as I indicated, although the UK government is suggesting this England-only uh, uh, body, there's no indication you know, that I can see that that would be up and running you know, within the next two years or so. I don't know if Katrina's got any further information on it. I understand that the proposal um, that the UK government has put forward is designed to put something in place for the end of the implementation period, if that goes ahead. OK, thank you. Yeah. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, could I uh, discuss with um, yourself, Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, uh, the statutory environment, environmental principles, which are obviously very important in, in underpinning um, the way forward. Uh, and uh, really the impact of, of this and how you would envisage the requirement to, as I understand it, have regard to environmental principles and, and I quote, where they're relevant to the provisions being made, unquote, would work. Well, uh, all our existing uh, domestic environmental legislation is already based on those uh, four principles and uh, the continuity bill uh, does include mechanisms that would embed that uh, um, for, for the future. The keeping pace power in the bill would enable us to keep our environmental legislation in line uh, with the standards of EU law. So it, th that was important because it, it won't be enough simply to mirror the state of EU environmental law as at the point of departure, uh, but for us to be able to find a way to continue to reflect the changes in EU law um, as we expect them to be progressive and that we would want to continue to uh, ensure that that's what happened. And that's, that's what we're talking about um, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the, the legislation. So, you know, making them statutory, uh, although we already have regard to them in all the domestic environmental stuff that we do, um, but also embedding that commitment to continue to reflect the change and making that uh, a statutory commitment as well. Thank you. And do you have concerns about the potential implications of the um, UK Withdrawal Act and um, our own continuity bill um, in the Scottish Parliament containing different environmental principles uh, and, and, of course, uh, also potentially the UK's written um, agreement? Um, well, I mean, obviously you know, the, the implications of, of uh, that are perhaps a little difficult at this stage to say. Officials are um, engaging uh, with DEFRA on the implications for devolved administrations and parliaments of the UK government's proposed approach 
uh, on principles. Um, uh, obviously, the continuity of bill applies to Scottish ministers um, and includes the commitment on the basis of the four EU environment principles, which I think we all agreed at the time was the right, uh, the right thing uh, to do. Um, uh, the commitment in the EU Withdrawal Act includes duties on the Secretary of State and Ministers of the Crown in relation to the four that we already know about, along with five other principles, and it's the implications of that that we need to do some work on, uh, because it's not quite clear uh, uh, what those implications would be. Uh, of course, the implications uh, within our own um, continuity bill um, uh, in the re relation to animal welfare um, requirements uh, recognising animals as sentient beings, which isn't in the in the UK. Um, uh, well, and, I, I, and I think that the other thing to, to keep in mind is that I think everything that the EU does is operating on the basis of the four key environmental principles. So, uh, you know, it's like trying to work out exactly how this is going to, how these proposals are going to work um, uh, um, from the perspective of devolved versus reserved, but also from our perspective of wanting to mirror what the EU is, is, is doing and as the EU progresses that we do as well. And, and could you just finally, uh, although I um, appreciate from uh, your previous response about um, environmental uh, court enforcement, um, could you make any comment at this stage about how the environmental principles will be monitored and enforced as we progress? Well, I think that's one of the things that we would be expecting to see discussed in the consultation. Um, uh, I, I don't want to prejudge what's in the consultation. And I don't want to prejudge the outcome of the consultation either. So that would be something that we would uh, try um, and use the consultation to uh, come to a decision on. Right, thank you. A brief supplementary from Finlay Carson. Thank you. It, there is an argument that there's a need for bringing together uh, the work on principles and governance as well as provisions for the Scottish environmental strategy. Can you tell me, is there any thoughts or potential uh, for combining the two processes or at least looking at the consultation results to bring both together? Um, in, a sense, in, a, in a sense, I expect the consultation will kind of do that anyway. I, 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 I don't think people are going to see an enormous differential between the two. Now, the continuity bill discussions were about uh, um, uh, principles and governance, and that was a very specific decision that was made in terms of the continuity bill, which is why we tend to talk about principles and governance, because the commitment we made uh, out of the continuity bill. The, the development of the environmental strategy uh, was a, a different commitment. Um, I, I suspect it will be difficult to keep the, the, the three things in, 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 separate, uh, in separate places, but, the, but the, the process of the environmental strategy hasn't been quite the same as the process that we've been undertaking in terms of governance and, and principles. But for that very obvious reason, that one has arisen very directly out of a legislative commitment, which, albeit the legislation hasn't actually been, you know, finalised yet, we don't quite know what that position is going to be. We've decided to proceed anyway, um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and separately on the, uh, on, uh, on the environmental strategy. Um, so I don't think we're smooshing them all together deliberately, but I suspect it will be quite hard to separate them out. <coughs> and now to questions from Mark Ruskell. So the environment strategy has been delayed. Uh, how can we develop an agriculture bill without the underpinning of an environment strategy? I don't really well, think, I think you, I mean, there isn't a fixed commitment to an agriculture uh, bill no, at this not. point, I mean, I mean, so I think that we're first. I'm not quite sure. I mean, if, if Mr. Ruskell wants to explain why he thinks it's ne what he thinks it's necessary to do, perhaps, because an agriculture bill may or may not be necessary for specific to, living purposes. But you know, I'm quite happy to try to answer Mr. Ruskell's question, if he wouldn't mind perhaps expanding on it a bit. Well, perhaps one point would be around the redesign of agricultural subsidies. Well, we've taken forward in the Stability and Simplicity paper, convener, which I've mentioned before, our proposals for um, providing the st stability and certainty, which I think um, farmers and crofters would wish to have. So we've set out already a vision whereby over <coughs> a period of five years, not to 2022, but beyond that, um, 
starting from 2019 to sort of 2024, a period of stability and simplicity. So we've, we've set out our vision in a plan which, uh, which we think is actually the most detailed plan that there is in the UK for proposed proposals about um, uh, how we move on from, from the CAP. Uh, and uh, I very much hope that we will have a chance, convener, in, in Parliament to debate that, if business permits, uh, before the end of the calendar year, although Brexit is having a, a sort of predatory effect on, on our parliamentary well, timetable as well I as could, other things. Perhaps I could focus you, Cabinet Secretary, on one area where we're clearly failing, and that's in terms of biodiversity. Uh, this committee took evidence in June this year. Uh, we took evidence that seven out of our 20 biodiversity targets uh, we're failing to deliver. One of those key targets was around habitat loss. We know that a major driver of habitat loss is agricultural intensification, and that there are opportunities here. But when we asked your officials about what progress had been delivered uh, in the government around considering the redesign of agricultural subsidies to deliver biodiversity, uh, your official said back in June that the thinking has just started now and that government would be coming back to this at some point later on this year. Well, I, th so I where, think with so respect where are we, to, uh, I think with respect to Secretary, the, you know, if my, you don't, my, my, can I finish? My, just where are we, Cabinet Secretary, in terms of a response to that particular issue, that particular target in relation to agriculture policy? All right. Um, well, I was going to say that, you know, I work very closely with, with my colleague about all these things. I'm very pleased, for example, that we've recently announced a, that the, the AICS scheme will continue for a further, run, further funding round. And on a very practical matter, that will make a very substantial contribution to the sorts of things that Mr. Ruskell, as well as the Scottish Government, wishes uh, to see. We're, uh, I think the question, perhaps, convener, doesn't seem to be directly related to Brexit, which I thought that this was the primary focus of the debate today, not uh, a general discussion about you know, what, what our agricultural and environment policies should be. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to uh, 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 with my colleague, to, uh, to write to the member to bring him up to date uh, on what's contained in our various proposals across the two portfolios. Uh, it is. I, I would say the Environment Act. Um, so. I, I do have questions around yeah, the we're, environment we're pressed for time, strategy. Mr. Um, and if I could just continue by saying that uh, the post-Brexit legislation that will emerge, so potentially an Environment Act, potentially uh, an Agriculture Act as well. Um, we've had comments from Mr Ewing uh, previously through the Food Commission where he says that a silo problem exists around Scotland. We've had a response from the Agricultural Champions re Report where again they say there is uh, fragmentation between um, policies, again a silo mentality. Um, how do you intend post-Brexit to take forward an integrated policy between environment and agriculture? How do you ensure that the environmental principles that we've just discussed that will be in an environmental strategy will be embedded in the post-Brexit subsidy regime that will emerge? Do you think that's a necessarily a fair characterisation of the whole of the findings of the agricultural Champions, we work very closely together. We're, we're looking, at, for, for example, at uh, uh, what more we can do to improve environmental practice in farming. We're working very closely on these matters. Uh, we're doing a great deal, and I've mentioned AICS. Uh, there are many other schemes to promote biodiversity and the environment, and uh, I think we're achieving a lot of a lot of progress in in large part due to the goodwill and desire of farmers and crofters to farm sustainably. Convener, after all. They are looking, in most cases, to pass on their land to future generations. Well, I mean, we do have a discussion ongoing about environmental strategy right now, um, uh, and uh, uh, there's uh, the, the intention is that that strategy will give that strategic uh, uh, statement of ambition, and that strategic statement will apply across government. That you know, it won't just be for me. we an environmental strategy. Uh, um, uh, across across government, and and it would help, I think, to coordinate action and guide future activity, uh, uh, particularly in relation to environmental ambitions. So, at the moment, we've got a conversation ongoing along these lines. We're currently considering responses to the online discussion on that, um, and we are engaging with public bodies and stakeholders, as I indicated 
uh, earlier um, uh, to help inform the development of it. So, you know, that is a that is a current and ongoing process, which you know will be gone through before any legislative decisions are made in the future, either about a possible agriculture bill or an environment act, which I have at the moment absolutely no uh, uh, plans to bring forward. But but there will be no strategy finalised. Can this be a final question? I'm sorry, question? I just said we're Do discussing we the strategy right now. But, but the letter we've had to committee says that, that there will now be a delay in the completion of the yeah, strategy. For a very short period of time, because we have to clarify what's actually happening right across the board in terms of uh, governance, uh, principles, strategy with respect to the, the deal which is currently being discussed uh, uh, in, in, in Westminster. Um, and what the implications are in respect of that, so that we don't go prematurely publish something that then turns out of, to be of limited use because of, of, of a situation which is not under our control. Principles. Thank you, everyone. We have run out of time. We've actually gone over time, so I'm going to bring this session to a close. I want to thank both Cabinet Secretaries and their officials for the time this morning. That concludes those um, items of the committee's agenda and public session. It's next meeting on the 11th of December. The committee will hear from a roundtable on biodiversity funding and implementation. The committee will also hear evidence from stakeholders on the REACH regulations 2019 and from the Minister of Environment and Wildlife um, legislation functions regulations. As previously agreed, the committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery now be vacated. We'll suspend briefly to allow the cabinet secretaries to leave. Thank you.